Welcome one, welcome all to the greatest show of them all. It is the NFC East Mixtape, I believe, Volume 98, so too shy of 100 um, since we created this thing. You can listen to the NFC East Mixtape wherever you get your NFC East blog, podcast, networks across SB Nation. That is Blogging the Boys for Dallas Cowboys coverage, Bleeding Green Nation for the Super Bowl present philadelphia eagles big blue view for the new york giants and of course hogs haven for the washington commanders you can also watch this show on the bleeding green nation youtube channel or the blog and the boys youtube channel i am rjo Cho from btb he is brandon lee gotten from bgn brandon happy super bowl week to you and the birds rj uh i'm not the best at emoting if you haven't noticed not the most expressive person but uh. i'm excited I'm fired up for the Super Bowl. I want it to be Sunday already. I know we have all this lead up and whatever. You know, we cover that as part of our jobs. But honestly, I really just want the game to be here. I'm already ready for the game. Yeah. Um, see, like, I don't know the, like, feeling that you or our special guest are kind of used to because you're like, oh, you know, the media week, I've already done that. Like, I already kind of lived that life when it comes mm-hmm. to the Super Bowl. If it were the Cowboys, I don't know that I would sleep. You know what I mean? I'd be kind of, like, soaking up every minute of it. Um, and I personally am a little bit bored of these two teams just because we've seen so much of them because they've had so much success uh, over the last few years. Obviously, the Eagles winning the Super Bowl. We'll get to the years thing um, later because I have a huge gripe oh, no. uh, that, that I want to explain. Uh, but if there is fatigue around any team in the NFL, it's not with the Eagles. Uh, it is with the Chiefs of Kansas City. And so joining us here today for the first time ever on the NFC East Mixtape is the man who covers the Chiefs at SB Nation for Arrowhead Pride. Uh, the, I guess, originator of the fraudulent AFC West Mixtape. It is from the SB Nation NFL show as well. Pete Sweeney. Pete, welcome to this side of things. What's up? I've always wanted to be on this show. Glad to finally get the invite. Do you feel um, like you're sort of at... at at the ground zero for mixtape, you know, creation right now? Uh, I, I suppose so. I, we, we decided to, to launch a, a, a podcast this year. I, I was very happy. Steven Serta came up with the idea called the AFC West mixtape. There, there's never been a podcast about an AFC division. And so we leaned into it and, and it's been a success. Bill, Bill Williamson, Michael Peterson, Tim Lynch, great guys. You know, the, the great thing about that podcast, you know, in that division is we have every team represented every show. And so there's never been anything like it. <laughs> All right. I guess it's my turn. All right, Pete. Um, <laughs> Eagles, Chiefs, Super Bowl week. It's here. So much to talk about. So much to get into. I just want to take the temperature, I guess, at the top. How are you feeling? How are you feeling about the Chiefs in general? Well, this is such a hard game to forecast. Not that, for example, you know, we're talking about division games. Division games always feel a little bit easier because the teams know each other so well. And there's so much to refer back to. But when you get to the Super Bowl and, man, as RJ was saying, and I'm not trying to to brag here, I've been able to cover this game. This is my third time in a couple of years, and it's so different. And how many? How how many would you say? I'm just curious for the purposes of the discussion. (sighs) Oh, no. Three Super Bowls. Three Super Bowls in how many years? Five. Five years. Four years. Four, four, three and four. Uh, Anyway, anyway, uh, I just think when you get to this game, it's just so hard to predict because we're so, I think, and and you guys can probably relate to this, you're so NFC focused all year. I mean, yeah, you have a couple games that that the AFC plays the NFC during the season, but you're really looking and studying a lot of the AFC teams. And so it's a little bit foreign to you when all of a sudden to have your season be a success, you have to end up beating this other really good team you don't know a lot about. Now there's all this crossover with Andy Reid and, and the Kelsey brothers and angles and angles and angles, but it's good. I mean, it, it's I, my temperature is heating up. I'm trying not to peak too soon. It is only Tuesday right now, but uh, it's exciting. And I, I think, uh, and trying to take any bias from you or me aside, I think the NFL got the two best teams this year that could possibly get. So hopefully that pans out in a, in a good game on Sunday. Well, thankfully, I'm here to not be biased at all um, with regards to this game. Um, Pete, so I'll be honest. I did not think, and we were in Miami together um, for the Super Bowl that the Chiefs won, um, and and I was not, at the time, all too impressed with the Niners. Now, my impression of them has obviously uh, grown in stature since then. They've obviously done some some impressive things this season. Obviously, I picked them to win the NFC Championship game. That went a weird way, whatever. Um, but, but that was never really in doubt for me. That just kind of felt inevitable. 
Um, the next year, I, along with Brandon, we were the only two people actually uh, from SB Nation's experts group to pick the Bucks. Now, I picked them because I wanted it to happen. Brandon picked them as a joke. So I really should only get the credit uh, <laughs> for that particular game. Um, but but I, I wanted it to happen despite, you know, because I, I had some Chiefs fatigue. Um, and But I thought the Chiefs would win handily. This is the maybe the most concerned I've been about the Chiefs in a Super Bowl. Do you share that sentiment? Like, is this the best team they've gone up against in their three? The Bucks team was pretty good defensively. They and and they were cooking, and they had a lot of weapons on offense. And Gronk and Brady had their thing going again. Uh, I think my concern is a little bit less in this one, only because the offensive line is healthy. I may, and I was slightly concerned heading into the the Chiefs Bucks game, and I I think we all missed the boat on that. We knew it was a story, but nobody thought it would be the story of the game. And so coming into this one, where and I think when you get to this game, and maybe Brandon will disagree with me here, I think experience really matters, you know, for the quarterback play. And just the fact that Mahomes will have an offensive line that isn't the third backup at each position gives me a little bit more confidence. Now you're facing the best pass rush team in the NFL. So I think they're going to have to help them. But I, I'm slightly less concerned maybe than the Bucs, just because from, from a health standpoint, they're, the Chiefs are in pretty good shape. They're really only going to be missing wide receiver. McCole Hardman is more of a, a, a role guy for them. Yeah, when you talk about the pass rush too, I mean, it's just, it's dominant. Um, historically, yeah. Eagles have sacked, this comes from our good friend, Shil Kapadia. Eagles have sacked opposing quarterbacks on 11.5% of their pass plays. It's the highest mark of any defense since at least 2000. And the difference in sack rate between the Eagles at number one this year and the Patriots at number two is the same difference between the Patriots and the number 29 Bengals. So that is insane. Like that is a huge drop off from just one and to two. Really quickly too, like the personnel for the Eagles defensively is what Patrick Mahomes tends to have trouble with. Whereas if a team has the personnel where you don't have to blitz and you could rush three or four and have your guys play cover on their pass catchers, those are usually the teams that give Pat, the most trouble now not every team has personnel like the eagles do which is why the chiefs win a lot of football games yeah and to that point i mean i said the eagles have a sack to opposing quarterbacks on 11.5 percent of their pass plays it's actually even better when they only rush fewer or four defenders when you look at that rate it's 11.8 percent so yes um i guess that's the key question here that's probably the, the top matchup of the game if you're an eagle fan listening to this um you're wondering how do the Eagles hope to contain Patrick Mahomes. And as someone who has watched Patrick Mahomes a lot, Pete, um, there aren't many games where he plays poorly, but like, is there any kind of through line in those games? Is there anything that's key, I guess, beyond just getting home with four? I think just when I've seen Mahomes struggle, he does have like a slight tendency to always look for a bigger play. And if you can get him into pressing a little bit, which happens rarely, uh, then then that's when he really starts to to play poorly. And in, as I was saying, and, and building upon the, the last point, I, I think teams that give Pat trouble and the Chiefs offense trouble force him to play in the intermediate and tempt him to throw deep into to double coverage. He's done a much better job at that this year than he did in previous years. The Chiefs have started to adapt, and I think that naturally happened when you no longer have Tyree Kill. Marquez Valdez-Scantling came on in the AFC Championship. I don't know how many games you're going to get that Marquez plays that well. It's been few and, and far between. And so I, I think you're going to have to to live in, in the center of the, the field when with these intermediate type of passes. And it's just, you know, can the Chiefs be disciplined enough to not throw into what are some good coverage players for for the Eagles? It's, it's all about, I, I think, again, just not – blitzing and and giving Mahomes a, a script where he has to nickel and dime his way down the field. And Brandon, as you know, that the worries, worrisome part about that against the Eagles is, man, the more plays you run, the better the opportunity for the turnover, which the Eagles have been pretty good at, at as well. So uh, this this should be a pretty good game, uh, I, I, I tend to think. And you know, I think on that side of the ball, that's sort of what I'm looking at. And then when the Chiefs are playing defensively, to me, it'll be establishing early that the Eagles are not going to run all over their ass. And I, I think if they can start to do that, then I think you see a, a nice back and forth. I, I think that there's a hidden script to this game where the under 
is you it, like gets hammered in, in the mm-hmm. in that they have the personnel and game plans to curb the other offense. Yeah, I could kind of see like maybe it being like a really quick game in that sense. Um, but it's- so a, a point I made, Pete, and this hasn't aged well because Jalen Hurts has been so great. Um, this was said when we had a little bit less of an idea who he was. I was I was so interested to see the Cowboys up against the Eagles because it felt like Dak was the better quarterback, but the Eagles obviously had the better team. So it was like, what is truly more important, the, the one of 53 or the 52 of 53, right? Because if you have the one, um, you know, that can make up for basically everything. And if anybody are has using, the one... Are we using Dan Orlovsky's rankings or just consensus oh, rankings? <laughs> we're definitely using um not those uh but so okay. if there is a, a one if there's a neo uh within the nfl universe it's patrick mahomes and so you know last week brandon and i were kind of talking on the mixtape like potential super bowl mvps and like i think we can we can see a path for a lot of different eagles players right like i could see a path for like darius slay winning mvp or hassan reddick right like there, there are so many players and stars on the eagles that you could kind of see that happening You really can't see it on the Chiefs. I mean, outside of Mahomes, obviously, and then maybe Travis Kelsey if things broke a certain way. So, like, who's the third? Who's the third person? Like, who's the player? Like, who's who's the the guy or the the whatever that we're just not seeing that you know? Uh, Maybe it is Marquez Valdez Scaling. Maybe it's Juju. I mean, like, who? Maybe it's Jarek McKinnon. But like, who is that person that that is a story or is a factor that is kind of flying below the surface? Yeah, I I think Brandon muttered it there. It's it's going to be if the Chiefs win this game, it'll be one of three players. 90% 90% it's going to be Patrick Mahomes. And then I, I think you split the, the other 5% to Travis Kelsey and uh, shout out to, to Kyle Barber. If he has another four touchdown game, like he had <laughs> after Kyle Barber said that Mark Andrews was the best tight end. I have never league. let this and go. Then all of a sudden, if Travis Kelsey has a three or four touchdown game, which he had multiple times this year. then yeah, I, I think Kelsey could win. Sure. Same thing on the, the defensive side. If, what I was just saying, the under plays out, like suddenly these high powered offenses finish in a 17 14 game, you know, that you never expected. And Chris Jones has two to three sacks. And I think you see a window for that. But more than likely, I mean, I, I would be stunned if it, the MVP at the end of this game is not Hurts or Mahomes. I, I would be, I mean, it, the percentage of it has to be for those two guys has to be north of 95%. Like you're, it's going to be one of those two guys. Going beyond the pass rush, which we already talked about, I guess what concerns you most about the Eagles in this game? Well, I, I just think there have been games this year where the Chiefs and, and, you know, one game in particular that I'm thinking of was you got Patrick Mahomes versus Malik Willis in the middle of the year against the Titans. And you're like, Mahomes versus Willis? <laughs> this is going to be – this is a breeze, right? But – Derrick Henry ran nine carries for 92 yards in the first half and they ran the clock out of the the half essentially with the lead. The Titans had the lead with Malik Willis at Arrowhead stadium. Uh, And and GHA field, please. Right. The G as Susie Colbert likes to call it. (laughs) Now I wonder if there is a plan where, where the Eagles and it's a different, run game right then then derrick henry you're just handing it off handing it off handing it off i wonder if there's a plan where you see them use the quarterback and the, the the running backs and play that type of game where let's say the eagles were to get the ball first 14 plays 13 plays 11 minutes off the clock the chiefs get the ball f- for the first time down seven with four minutes left and let's say the eagles defense performs well and hmm. manages a three or six and out and then they are getting the ball to start in the second quarter with, and with that run game that did what it just did. I, I think that that's the key for me it, because it, I think the Chiefs can dictate that early. Like they want Jalen Hurts to throw the football, right? Like that's that's what I, I think you want to see. So establishing that the run defense is going to play well early and then in the meantime, getting the ball back and scoring. So like, I mean, it's simple. Yeah, you got to score points to, to win the game. But if the Chiefs can say, all right, you're not going to run on us today and then come out to like a 10 to 14 point lead, I'm going to be feeling pretty good about the Kansas City's chances. It's just the evil Eagles, are, I think, are going to want to establish that type of game early. Um, P, I'll give you a chance to defend this point that, that Brandon and I brought up last week. Uh, there's been a lot of chatter, obviously, about the Eagles haven't played anybody. Brock Purdy injured in the title game. The Giants were kind of frauds, whatever. Easiest strength of schedule, blah, blah, blah. What, what is the signature win of the Chiefs season? We, we were 
genuinely struggling to answer that ourselves. Um, we talked about how, you know, the Eagles flew close to the sun against the Colts. The Chiefs lost to the Colts. I mean, you know, the Chiefs went to overtime against the Texans, right? Like there's a lot of people who who kind of feel like the Chiefs aren't taking the same sort of heat. Um, the, the answer we kind of landed on, uh, because yeah. we also talked about the Malik Willis thing and the struggle and because that was kind of a game winning drive sort of situation. We talked about the Niners win. But again, like that was, you know, that was a little bit different, um, kind of hard to really value that. But what is the answer in your opinion? Um, I'm, I just pulled up the schedule. The, the Chiefs had a wow, really you don't soft, have it memorized. Embarrassing. The Chiefs had a really soft end of their schedule. I would I know that they asked for one game, but I would point to three games when they played their best against the Bucks and 49ers before their by going into those games, the Bucks and 49ers were getting Eagles like this defense is incredible. You can't stop them. And they dropped 40 on both teams going into those games. I know that we thought differently about the Bucks at the end of the year. And then I, I think there was a, a game that they flexed to Sunday night football on November 20th against the playoff mm. team, Brandon Staley's chargers. And this was a game that they didn't have Juju Smith Schuster and the chargers ended up taking the lead three different times in this game. And Kansas city just kept going and going and going. And that to me, it just shows you that like, you can't count the chiefs at it. And then for me too, I think the chiefs, played a much better quarterback in the AFC title. I know you probably don't want that as an answer, but uh, I think if you could design a, a season and you can slam a button, hey, you're going to have to play a really good defense, but their quarterback is going to be the last pick in the draft. I mean, I think everybody's hammering that magic button. So I I, I don't think that Eagle, if there's one benefit to the, the Chiefs as far as like a mystery goes, the Eagles have not played a team like this in the playoffs. Uh, and like, I, I just think it, I, as much as I, there's a, a scenario where the Eagles could, could dominate the game if they utilize the run game, I, I think there's a, a, a like smack them in the mouth type of, um, you know, we're not dealing with the Giants anymore, you know, or um, what would be Brock Purdy. I mean, this is the MVP of the league. So that plays, I, I think the Chiefs have like some slightly tougher games along the way. And the Eagles can't control their schedule. You know, it's a Brandon's continued point, and I agree with this. It's like, yeah, they had they had the schedule they had, but they were smacking these teams. Well, and they, and they earned it. That's the point, Brandon. Like, just like the, I mean, the Chiefs was a little bit more debatable, obviously, with the, everything. Yeah. But like, if you earn the one seed, you earn the one seed. Yeah, yeah and this is, not gonna be, this is not going to be popular with Brandon. And I'm sorry, Brandon, but I think the Chiefs have already played the best team they're going to play in these playoffs in the Bengals. Mm. I, I think the Bengals wow. have beaten the Eagles as well. Right, <laughs> I, Bulletin I board material, that. baby. And I He's on Twitter great. at PG Sween just for all yeah, of the Eagles I think fans. I think the Eagles are a great team. I just don't think they're better than the Bengals or the Chiefs. Mm. Eagles were 7-1 and one when they faced <laughs> playoff teams this season with a league-leading 100 – and 15 point differential that's 51 points better than any other team and the one loss was to the cowboys as rj will remember uh with gardner Minshew starting at quarterback so you know yeah i think you have to consider the that Chiefs and Eagles both have some bad losses on there i mean the the colts game was a disaster um but then you you know you turn to the commanders thing so yeah i think those games were in a similar veins so of like kind of fluky i remember yeah. you were saying i didn't watch the colts game uh, but i know you said like there are a lot of drops and just kind of like weird timing things in there special, yes it was a lot of special teams gaffes they were yeah. they had i don't know how this guy named matt amandola continued to get jobs all year because he was one of the worst professional kickers that i had ever seen and yeah uh, they ended up going for fake field goals in this game and you know uh chris jones talked to matt ryan which got the, Matt Ryan to extend the game winning drive, maybe the last good moment of, of his career. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, fluky, fluky for the, the chiefs too. And they, they played pretty well and then only ended up losing to two contenders the rest of the way. So my last question for you uh, is you already kind of talked about what the story is. If the chiefs win this game on Monday football, Monday last week on the SB nation NFL show in terms of being a dynasty, because yeah. of you know multiple Super Bowls and then just being there and having the success they've had it's five straight AFC championship games. Let's flip it around the other way. What's the story if they go to five straight AFC championship games, like Andy e. Reid once upon a time went to four in Philly and didn't win any Super Bowls. You have didn't the he one. To, didn't he play in five straight though? Um, I guess I thought it was four. I, think... I don't know. Anyway, oh, sorry. the point is right. like you know you make it to the point is the bigger the larger point here is like what is the story. If they lose this game. Yeah. 
I think you, you're right on it. Uh, it's Andy Reid. I, I mean, regardless of how the game goes, I, I think the biggest story coming out of it will be what it means for the narrative of Andy Reid because it's one game, right? And, it, you know, in the grand scheme of things, it really could go either way. I mean, I'm not, I'm not sitting here telling you think I think the Chiefs would win 10 out of 10 times. That, that'd be ridiculous. Like maybe I'm, maybe I'm at six or seven, right? So it's possible and it's unfair. But if the Chiefs win this game, Andy Reid it begins to be talked about in the realm of Belichick and those types of, you know, is this really the, one of the best co- head coaches of all time, if not the best, because now you have guys that could say, well, he's really been successful with two franchises. Bill can't say that. Like there's things Bill can't say that Andy has accomplished. Now, if he loses, I think a lot of people 10 years from now, 20 years from now, I, as you tell the story of Andy Reid, he'll be, this coach and a lot of people will always counter with, yeah, but you know, he got to those championship games, but could never really get it done. Yeah. They did it the one year, but that took a 10 point comeback in the fourth quarter. Like that was kind of miraculous, right? Like against a, a coach who's kind of known for collapsing late in games. In, and a who isn't like in, amazing. in conference title. Yeah. And, and, and it's unfair because it's just so hard to get to that point. And like, if you really look at even the Brady Super Bowls, right. A couple of, of the, like, you know, a lot of them could have went either way, but they happen to go his way and he's the best quarterback of all time. And no one's going to argue that, but man, the margin was small. And so I don't know how fair that is, but that's the reality. It, it It's a, it's a tale of two very different narratives for Andy Reid. My last question, P is kind of along these lines and it sounds stupid um, to kind of put it this way, but um, your, your most infamous line ever on the SB Nation NFL show was that Patrick <laughs> Mahomes refused to lose. Yeah, um, never, he never, he, it's never his fault when the team loses. <laughs> and so, like, even to that point, though, I think it's silly that we're now all of a sudden, like, only putting the blame. I know you didn't do that, but, like, only putting the blame for the loss on Andy Reid. Or, like, he's the only person whose legacy is, like, tarnished by that. If Patrick Mahomes goes to five AFC title games and only has one Super Bowl to show for it, that's also on Patrick Mahomes. It isn't just Andy Reid. Um, like Andy Reid's history in Philly isn't a part of Mahomes' legacy, but I digress from that. And, and so, like to all of that, I do think this is, and I'm curious if you agree, the highest pressure moment in the Mahomes era for the Chiefs. So, I, I like what 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 is like, it's the Super Bowl, right? And so they've played in two of them before. So, like maybe it's the same as that, but like you know, the the stakes are are so different. I think the Eagles have much less to lose because they lose the Super Bowl. It's like whatever, dude. I mean, it's, it sucks, but it's like yeah. you won one, you know, in 2017. You're in year two of Sirianni. You have all the like hope and future in the world to be like excited about moving forward. Again, you just kind of deal with it and lick your wounds. But if it's the Chiefs, it's like man, like maybe that we have seen the best. Maybe, maybe like they're they're not even going to get back. Like the Bengals are coming, yeah. the Bills are going to get it together, the Chargers because oh, watch out for Kellen Moore. I mean, whatever. But like, like when was the last time they had this much hanging over them? Is I guess my question. Last week, you know, I you know I'm not trying to yeah, please, please get arrives two weeks ago. I know you don't understand out. time. Like, I I think the Chiefs are still the class of the AFC, and Andy Reid is what 64. Mahomes is 27. I just talked about Tom Brady, and and we're you know in Kansas City, a lot of people hope and, and that that he can have the type of career similar. Brady lost three Super Bowls. If they, if two of those Super Bowls would have happened first instead of amongst them, you would have looked at Brady differently. I, I don't think Mahomes' legacy is, is as much on the line as it was against Joe Burrow a couple weeks ago. Because I think in Joe Burrow, before the game, Pat Patrick Mahomes was great against everybody, but he had his Achilles mm-hmm. heel that he just couldn't beat, and he was able to overcome that. And I, I just think there's so much of the Mahomes story to be told. Whereas Andy, more of that story has been told than is ahead. We know that. I don't know how many years it's going to be, but it's 20 years or behind him already, right? Maybe it's five, six, whatever. So just, it matters more because the time is limited for Andy Reid. I think the bigger loss for Mahomes would have been against Burrow again for the fourth time in like 400 days, allowing them to go to the Super Bowl last year. That was a big monkey off his back and then not to say that he's not going to be refusing to lose against the Philadelphia Eagles but I just think the pressure of the quarterback to an extent was more against that AFC foe last week and and like I said I I think and this is what again two very good teams what what tips the scale for me is just that experience of being here before I, I there you know there's a I think there's a scenario in which this is is too high pressure of a moment for 
Jalen Hurts. Not to say that that he he is faltered along the way here, but I just think that's a that experience of, of being in the championship game is is important. I think as the Chiefs go into this, he is on Twitter at score P- prediction G Sween. Made a score prediction score out of this. Yeah. Do you do I have to give an exact score? I'm still working on it. I, I have an I kind of have an idea of what I, I see happening. You, you can give us one with the qualifier that it's subject to change. So like we're yeah. we're not going to hold you to it. This isn't necessarily your final. Yeah, yeah. I have we need it. like we need it, but you can change it. I th- I like the Chiefs by ten. Okay. I I think that I just think that they're going to have Pete, a good I'm plan. Not my, enjoying my, this. <laughs> my my uh my my thing is that like I I mean I've said it five times, but I'll say it one more time like. It, I think they'll have a plan for the run game. If they can establish that early in the first quarter, I'll, I'm going to feel very good about the Chiefs' chances. My prediction is going to go out the window if they, you know, run 60 yards in the first drive and suddenly the Eagles have the lead. Yeah. Wow. Chiefs by 10. Uh, what's your favorite Rihanna song? Um, I don't uh, – Found Love in a Hopeless Place. It's called We Found Love is the name of that song. So. <laughs> Um, he is on Twitter at PG Sweeney, so you can tell him what you think of his Chiefs by 10 score prediction. You can hear him uh, on the SB Nation NFL show with me. He won't be there on Monday. Well, actually, I don't know. You were supposed to answer that Slack message, uh, so we still don't know if you're going to be there. I'll get, I'll get you that. I'll get that to you. Yeah, thanks a lot, Pete. Um, Pete, you have a wonderful day. Uh, can you tell us, actually, last question, who the pre-come-up of the week is for the Super Bowl? Ooh. Um shoot <laughs> hopefully not kenny gainwell right uh mm. i i guess um let's go let's go uh juju on the on the big stage mm. Seems like he's gonna be able to play so i just saw that he has an incentive in his contract that if the chief when he wins a million dollars um mm. uh with as long as he has 50 percent playing time in the game so juju didn't sign for a lot of money he was slightly under a thousand yards this year if he has a big super bowl it, it it not only as you would say what we're saying would get him money instantly, but I think he, he stands to make a lot of money in the free agency market as well. So. Uh, you- Pete Sweeney, everybody check out airheadpride.com. One love, we found love. He's out of here. Um, should we take a break and then come back and wrap this whole thing up with some Eagles talk? Yeah, I have some reactions to what Pete said, but we can get to it after the break. <laughs> okay, we will be right back. Welcome back. While we were gone, Brandon. Um, you went and looked through your uh, Rihanna discography collection, and you have a suggestion for your favorite Rihanna song. Yeah, I mean, it's obviously Umbrella, you know, a classic. <laughs> I was going to say, please don't stop the music. So I'm glad we at least had three different answers here. Um, can I go first with reactions to Pete? Because, like, this is the Eagle side of the conversation. Um, but I, I think you will find my reactions interesting. Okay. Obviously rooting for the Chiefs. And I, I have like a, a bit of a like closing mm, statement debatable. I want to get off, um, you know, before we leave here. So I'm obviously rooting for the Chiefs. Not a fan of anything, PT. <laughs> like that's uh, some bad vibes, mm. super scary vibes. That is like counting. The, is, I feel like the chickens are being counted and they haven't hatched yet. Um, now, I will give the Chiefs like I, I understand. I know people like clap back at this idea. I understand if you, whoever you are, have some fatigue about the Chiefs, right? Like that's natural, right? Like it's it's boring and dated. You've seen it a million times. Like we've heard all these stories. Like the Kelsey Bowl stuff is fun and a cool twist, Andy Reid, whatever. But like I get it if you have some Mahomes fatigue. I am all for like, you know, rolling out the red carpet a little bit further if they win this game, especially the way Pete said, right? Like if, if you go in there and you shut down this Eagles team that nobody's been able to shut down all season long, by all means, we'll line up and we'll sing your praises. Um, but to act like it's a – and I know he's not, like, proclaiming anything, but, like, to act like it's, like, reasonably within the realm of possibility um, is a bit of a an assumption I wouldn't make uh, personally. And so um, some bad vibes. I do not want to see the reality that I think is going to unfold unfold based on what Pete said. On Juju, because Juju was brought up there, I think there's some bad Juju going on for the Chiefs because he was asked on Super Bowl opening night uh, about cheesesteaks or, or something to the effect oh, of yeah, yeah. the best cheesesteaks don't even feel like he was very clearly a troll attempt, but it was a very like not unique and bad troll attempt because then he was asked, well, where are better ones? And he's like, I don't know, but definitely not in Philly. Like it was just like lame. And I think is that's that a thing? Ju- like, do do Pittsburgh people do that? Because I mean, that that would make some sense then. I mean, just to just to try to understand the genesis of this. 
No, I don't. I don't. I think it just speaks to Juju kind of being viewed as maybe immature mm. at times okay. and not like the most, maybe an unserious, that's the best way to put it, unserious kind of player. I just didn't think that was good vibes. Um, there's some other things that aren't even necessarily directly related to the Chiefs, but all this 49ers whining that is still going on. You have Brandon IU coming out here saying the Eagles got extremely lucky. Like all of that is only working in the Eagles' favor to me. Like that's only like making them stronger because it's just like, we can't even get respect after we blew this team out in the championship game. But I think the the biggest thing I wanted to respond to about Pete, he brought up the, or you, sorry, you brought up the refuse to lose line from. Um, Should we explain yes. that? Like just Can. so in case anyone hasn't heard um, this was the 2020 season. That was Herbert's rookie year. Right. Um, and it was actually the game, the Terod Taylor um, injection game. Um, when, when the injection went wrong and he and Herbert had to jump in, in and start. And I don't remember what the score situation was, but it was a lot tighter, obviously, than anybody anticipated, especially, you know, with the quarterback situation unfolding the way it did. Um, and the Chiefs came back and won. And I believe they converted a third and 20. And I think mm. Mahomes even like scrambled for the first down, if, if that um, is correct. And the next Monday, Pete Michael kissed. Shout out to BGN Radio, obviously. Um, and I were talking about it. And Pete said... You know, this guy just refuses to lose. And I love Pete, but he said that in all seriousness. Like <laughs> like that there was no uh juju troll attempt there. It was like completely and totally no, serious. No, he believes and, it. Uh Kist and I equally rolled our eyes uh because we were like, dude, come on. Like it was just whatever. The the chargers collapsed. But just just so everyone has full context. I'm sorry, I don't want to interrupt. This is your show, but I just wanted the information to be there. Well, I think there's something to that about Jalen Hurts. When it comes to the Nick Sirianni comparing him to Michael Jordan, I think that's what he's getting at. It's it's and it's something that it's hard to talk about because it sounds very like yeah, wouldn't any player in theory like refuse to lose because they all want to win? Duh. But I think it's at a different level, and I think it's how it manifests. I think with Mahomes, it's different in that he's just so talented. Like he can just do crazy, insane things that no one else can do. I think with Hurts, there's just this belief. I think you see it in the team. And I think the team has taken on that personality of feeling like, like I always talk about how Hertz is so composed. And this is why I'll push back on Pete saying like, you know, worrying about like the moment, the moment's not too big for Jalen Hertz. That's like my, the least of my concerns or lack of experience. I mean, I, I think you can argue the chiefs are actually suffer from lack of experience in the terms of, especially like you look at their secondary, a lot of rookies and young players playing out there, especially going up against Devonte Smith and AJ Brown. Um, but Hertz might be young, but I, I don't worry about any kind of you know moment being too big for him by any means. I think that's you know that's something he has covered. He is super composed, and I think the the whole team has taken on that vibe. I think they're loose. I don't see any concerns about this team being uptight. Uh, I will say, as a zooming out a bit here, I don't feel as confident as I felt in the Eagles winning the Super Bowl in 2017. There was just like literally no doubt in my mind after. They beat the Vikings in the championship game. I was flying out to Minnesota that week. I wrote an article on the plane, like talking about how they were going to win. Like I, I, I was rereading that article recently, and I was saying I felt like I looked into a crystal ball and I saw the outcome of the. Like that's I just the confidence I had, and I don't think it was cocky. I just like that's legitimately how I felt. I feel a little bit different this time. I'm not worried about the Eagles losing. I just think it's going to be a situation where it's a close game and someone's going to make a play at the end. It could be either team. I just think it's going to be kind of a coin flip game is how I feel about it. I, I'm going to pick the Eagles to win because I believe in Hurts at the end of the day and that composure and everything they have going on. But the Chiefs are really good, too. Mahomes is really good. So it's just I think it's a coin flip game. Um, This to me is like we, we talk about seeing a path a lot. And I mentioned that to Pete, but like, um, like I think we could have seen a path to the Bengals winning the Super Bowl a year ago, right? Or we could have seen a path sure. to the Chiefs winning the Super Bowl two years ago, right? Or even a path to the Niners winning. They, they were up by 10, you know, winning the Super Bowl three years ago. Um, the, this is the, like, closest I feel like the two paths are, right? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, they're almost, like, on the same path. Like, the deviation off of, like, the center line is, like, 1% for each team. They're the, that closely intertwined. And so, like, this is why we don't have to, like, whoever loses this game make this dramatic 
you know, leap because it is such a close thing. Like the margin, I, I love that point about Tom Brady. Like the, the Super Bowls he won, like the Malcolm Butler pick, that was a super tight sort of thing at the very end. They overcame 20 to three, right? And, you know, even the the one they beat the Rams in the second time was like not that great of a game. It took that big Gronk play at the very end. But you could just as easily, you know, play that game the other way. I don't think people give Brady that benefit. I mean, if not for the David Tyree catch, right? Like if not for, if, I, if Asante Samuel catches that interception, right? Like, and and if, you know, if if the Hail Mary works against the Giants the second time, like you could you could play the what if game a lot of ways, obviously. And so we don't have to make that huge conclusion. Um, I agree with a lot of what you said, and it bums me out to do so. You know, when I started to like really worry this week about the Eagles winning, because obviously I don't want to see that happen. Um, you mentioned Super Bowl Media Night, the way the Eagles players walked in. Super mm. chill. Like, like they looked bored. <laughs> like they they looked like, you know. And, and like, whatever, I, I don't have a problem with people enjoying it. Like, it's a Super Bowl. You should you should experience it. Like, you shouldn't be like, I don't want to enjoy it or have fun because we might lose. Like, you, you don't know if you'll get back. Like, it's very, very difficult to do. Uh, but they looked super, super, super bored. Um, I'm surprised. I, I'm not here to troll. Like, that's not my thing. Like, the Eagles are a great team. I'm super fine admitting it. Um, but I'm surprised we haven't heard, like, well, Jalen Hurts got pulled in the national championship. I really thought we'd get that kind of like take this week, and the week is still young. But so, um, maybe like he, it's it's not like he has no experience. Like I recognize that's not the Super Bowl, but like the dude has played in some yeah. massive college football moments Huge. and some massive NFL games. Um, so you know whatever. I recognize Mahomes has obviously played in some big games. I I don't know. I, it's so hard to get a read on the Chiefs because like I think that. The, the Eagles, t to me, generally, like, this is the disposition of Philly as a whole. Tries to, like, underdog it up. And so it is strange when you're not the underdog, right? I remember after um, after the Seahawks won the NFC title game against McCarthy's Packers, the crazy comeback, I think, I don't know if it was Jermaine Curse or Doug Baldwin was, like, screaming into the camera. They were like, y'all doubted us. It was like, you were the one seat at home. Like, <laughs> like you know, like, what, what are you talking hey, about? Like, I mean, Belichick did that with... The Patriots all the time, like that's he. he, no, I mean, he that's one of the and, things and, I want to give him credit for. He always kudos. had that mentality. Yeah. All, all I'm saying is, like, it does sound silly on paper to be like, oh, it, for, it, for, hundred percent for either, for either of these two teams to be like everybody's doubting us. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, the, well, you just said on the, paper last week. Right, the right. Eagles felt slighted because George Kittle said on paper the Eagles defense is good on paper, which I thought was a really tame. I don't even think he was taking a shot. Maybe like very subtle, very slight, but the Eagles used it as fuel. And I think that's that's a credit to Sirianni. Hey, Julian Love out here in Good Morning Football criticizing Nick Sirianni, saying he's just along for the ride and anyone could coach that team to a Super Bowl. I mean, I think one of the great things that Sirianni has done is fostered this culture of, hey, we are the underdogs. Our, our people, we're being disrespected. We're not getting that proper respect. Uh, and is it silly? Maybe. Yeah, but I think it's working for them. It's like what you say about the uh, getting all these people to – uh, to believe the sky is orange, get, right? And yeah, if, if you get they do, then it players is. Yeah. To believe the sky is orange, then yeah. it is orange. And so, yeah, I'm with you. And I've I've given Sirianni his credit for that. Um, I know a lot of people think it's silly or whatever, but if it works, right? Like if, if it has a tangible effect, then who cares, right? Like if you win the Super Bowl, who cares? Like nobody will care if you win the Super Bowl. Um, and so but that's another like, reason, real quick, that why like I'm more confident in the Eagles. Like, why is Julian Love coming out and saying that? What does he have to gain? Why is Brandon now you coming out and saying that? It's you're just giving them this team that you hate. More, more fuel like don't do that <laughs> as a, if i really try to remove my obvious bias against the eagles so like i'm, I'm really doing my best here i think that football fans feel cheated not that they, like the eagles are cheating or anything but i feel like people like it's so kind of boring to not see like this great team get tested right and so like you can argue that like we talked about how it felt like we were robbed of a great game in the nfc title game whatever and like that's just the schedule so i, I think that like that's like a, a deep psychological thing for people is they feel cheated or robbed or whatever that like this eagles team hasn't really been pushed and like we've talked about the cowboys game like yeah they were pushing that game and they lost but it wasn't Jalen. you know what i mean like it doesn't feel like we've really seen them push to their brink and i think people want to see that if that happens and they win i think people will really celebrate them so we can I'll admit, right, that if the Eagles do beat Patrick Mahomes and Andy Reid, they can't that we can't say that anymore, right? Is that or is it only well they only had the one good game? Like, like can I'm we admit say, that if they win this game, that there's nothing fluky about it and they actually deserve respect? I'm gonna say two things that I really wish weren't true, but they have to be true if the Eagles win this game. One, what you just said is true. But two, if the Eagles win this game, like you can any Super Bowl win is sweet, right? Like, you yeah. know, nobody nobody cares like how you won the Super Bowl. If you win it, cool. But like if you if the Eagles win the Super Bowl and you're an Eagles fan, like and if you're like a, a conscious Eagles fan, right? Like obviously there are little kids that are Eagles fans that won't remember this or whatever. Believe me, I know that life. Um, but like 
th- this is the two best Super Bowl wins you could possibly have. Yeah. I, like, I, I don't know of a way to like dream one up that would be greater. Like, Brady, it would have been cool. It would have been cooler. Mahomes, the, the full story was cool, but it would have been cooler to not have to deal with the like drama afterwards. I think that's fair to say. Like, that was probably annoying, but still, like. The further and further we get away from it, I just saw before we started recording that Nick Foles wants to retire an Eagle, right? Like, mm-hmm. so that is cool for the obvious reasons. So if you knock off Brady and you knock off the dude that everybody says is Brady and the dude who's only been knocked off by Brady, you know what I mean? Like, it's As opposed it's really to sweet. Lovey Smith and uh, Rex Grossman, sure, yeah. I mean, that yeah. If you're talking about you know Peyton, I, fine, we can call Peyton great. Like, we don't have to you know pick up. Well, I'm just saying, like, if you're going to talk about like the contrast, that's what it is. Right. And so, and, and I've said this before too, if the Eagles, win, if we just look at this season, this is the, like, you know, people say this expression a lot, like, oh, it was like a Madden game, right? Like the quarterback threw for 300 yards, the running back ran for a hundred, the receivers got a hundred yards each. This is like a Madden season. This is like a franchise season. If you, if, and you're like running the Eagles, right? Like everybody's an all pro, everybody's a pro bowler, everybody set <laughs> yeah. records, you know what I mean? Like, and then they won the Super Bowl. Like it, it mm-hmm. nobody will like, People can say whatever they want. Like, and that that's my, I said I wanted to have like a closing statement. I'm not saying we have to end, but like my whole perspective here, I hope the Eagles lose with all of me. But if they win, they're a great team. They, they are a great team no matter what. But if they win, like, and you're an Eagles fan, like rub it in everyone's face, like rub it in my face. Like you deserve it. Like it is such a sweet season. And if you get the cherry on top, like, I mean, dude, like what, what more could you ask? I mean, and the Sirianni stuff is whatever, but the dude embodied the culture that you, not you, Brandon, but like you say you're proud of and you say is representative of your city and your people and everything. And in its own way, that is cool. And so like he made everybody hate you. <laughs> like, and, and if you're the the kind of Philly fan that relishes in that, like th- this was as Philly of a season as it could possibly be. Yeah, I think the last thing I'll say here is that, you know, I've said before, season's kind of a failure if they don't win the Super Bowl. It, it's uh, maybe I need to parse that a bit more. It's a wasted opportunity, obviously, a hundred percent. But I don't think it's a failure from the standpoint of it was still an incredibly enjoyable year. Um, a lot of likable, rootable players on the team. Um, you right future about too. Super, super, and in Jalen Hurts is twenty four. He's going to be here for the future. You know, a lot of things will change. You can't just take for granted that this window is going to stay open forever. The Eagles' last Super Bowl run is an example of that. <laughs> um, but at the same time, just because that happened doesn't mean it will necessarily again. And I think there is more staying power for this quarterback. To your point about Super Bowl opening night and the confidence that you saw in the team, how about just the talent? Like, look at the all the players, the stars on the podiums that the Eagles had versus, like, you have – George Karlaftis, uh, Benjamin Solak made this point on the Philly special yeah, podcast. Like on, he, nice. he's like, he's one of the players at their podium. He's like a rookie defense event. Like nice play. I like George Karlaftis. I think he's a nice player. But you have like that <laughs> as one of your top representatives. Versus versus Hassan Reddick, right? AJ yeah. Brown and Hassan Reddick and Brandon Graham and uh, Devon and like just all, you know all these like stars on this roster, which is no surprise. We talked about how loaded the Eagles are. Many points throughout the year. And leading up into this game about quarterback versus roster kind of thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, this is like a team you can be proud of, right? Like this is a team that like you're very proud of. They historic season in terms of sacks, in terms of wins. You're feeling good about a lot of things, not guaranteed to happen again. But there's reason to believe, especially in an NFC conference that does not very uh does not have a, a, a much of apparent power players with staying power in terms of like, you know, oh, he's are these are the clear behemoths of the conference much like the afc does by contrast then yeah you feel good about that um what's your prediction for this game or do you want to make that later uh in a little bit i just have a few more like kind of things i want to tidy up here um on the hassan reddick point i would i still believe micah parsons is a better player I'm not here to like hmm. you know sing that song and dance but he's he's but it an wasn't amazing that far player. off at no, worst but case what my I don't want to call it an annoyance and it has nothing to do with Hassan, but like, and I I've given Howie Roseman an enormous amount of credit. In fact, I'm the true Howie Stan on this show. At least Um, if we want to give Howie, we should give Howie credit for the AJ Brown trade by all means, like Howie. And I was wrong. I read my apology letter, et cetera, et cetera. I think we need to stop giving Howie credit for the Hassan Reddick thing. Like you yourself have talked about, like it wasn't a big deal. Hang on. Just hear me out. Like, I like there's no way how he saw this like, no 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 like there's no way how he saw this that's what I'm saying like Hassan deserves the credit for this like you know what I'm saying like ha- like he deserves like, a lot of credit but I think more than I'm, one I'm thing just saying can be like true. I it's fine multiple things can be true all I'm saying but is it was like, a good I bet think Howie, RJ, it was a really good bet to me no you're betting it, it, on a play. 
I'm I'm not this is not a criticism by any means. I'm saying I don't think Hassan individually gets enough credit for his season. You know, and I know you've been high on him, but like how he clearly saw something with AJ Brown, right? Which is why he was willing to to send the compensation that he was and he gave him the deal that he did. And I'm not saying like, oh, he thought Hassan was a loser or anything like that, but like it was a bet, right? It was it was a more of a gamble. And he and he hit. So like certainly credit to Howie, but like huge credit to Hassan for like cashing in when a lot of people didn't really believe in him. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like he didn't get the deal that you that you would think he did based on his performance. That's all I'm saying. Like, I think Hassan Reddick deserves the the bulk of the credit for his season um and for what he's done as opposed to like other circumstances like Darius Slay or AJ Brown or James Bradbury. I think you get my point. I think it's important to give credit to the players like you're doing there. I think a lot of people tend to kind of fall into a trap of when they talk about Jordan Mailata, who's had a lot of success coming from literally never playing football at any level to being, you know, like a very high quality uh, left tackle in the NFL. And a lot of people want to be like, Jeff Stoutland, you know, made him. And it's like, yes, I definitely want to give the Eagles offensive line coach who's clearly very good and just signed an extension credit, but you have to give Jordan Mailata a lot of credit too because right. he put a lot that's, of like the hard work in to become that's that That's my point. So I get that, but I, I again, from a, a bet standpoint, I love the bet because you're just, just looking at his production that he had, his age, the fact that he was so misused and didn't even play a ton early in his career. Like You made a, a logical bet, and for the money, he's not even a top 15 paid edge player. That's insane. He's 19 and a half sacks in 19 games. Like that's, That is correct. You don't, like, those kind of players don't even become available, first of all, on the market. And, and then second of all, when they do, you have to pay like out the wazoo for that. That's exactly what I'm saying. Like, all of, like, if we had li- lined up odds on them turning in like these kinds of seasons, like for Hassan, they would have been like a hundred to one. Versus like for AJ, they would have been like I don't know, like twenty to one. You get what I'm saying? Like, and and kudos to Howie for making that bet. All I'm saying is the odds were what they were. You know, and and so like good for him. Like he got this great season for like not a great cost. And like if there's more than enough credit to go around. And so I I I want to say I've come to a real I don't say realization, but like I'm ready to say something that I uh, I think I've known for a while, but I would say about five years ago, I still argued a little bit, but like I haven't argued it, you know, vigorously. Um, that Jason Kelsey is obviously the, the best, you mm. know, offensive lineman, you know, whatever. Blah, blah, the blah. most but, overrated. Well, so there was a little bit of, of like name value to that, that I do think serves with other players, not him, like when it comes to Pro Bowls and stuff like that. So that was kind of where I was coming from. And obviously I thought tra- very highly of Travis Frederick. So like looking, you know, within the division, it was a really interesting conversation for a while. There's no question that Jason Kelsey is the superior player. This is my take. Jason Kelsey is the best Eagles player that I have seen in my lifetime. Mm. Like no- nobody else has been as great of a player for the Eagles specifically as Jason Kelsey has in my lifetime. That's that's where I'm willing to come down. Like I'm, I think that highly of him, and I I am so annoyed at how funny and likable he is. Like it is so frustrating that his podcast is awesome. Like there's just <laughs> everything. Like it's just the most frustrating thing in the world. I really cannot stand that. Uh, but he is the best Eagles player in my lifetime. He's like Mister Eagle, right? In your that, eyes, yeah, if, in ter- if I if I was in charge of like constructing an Eagles Mount Rushmore, he would be like the center figure. For players that have played in my lifetime. Again, like I'm not diminishing the past. I'm just talking about, you know, whatever, 21st century, a little bit before that. It's pretty crazy, too, because there was a time leading into the 2017 season where it was like, you know, they might get rid of him. They might trade him, might cut him to save salary. And he's really had, I don't want to call it elite career surgeons because i think he was good earlier and probably didn't get the proper attention because he was a six-round pick and i think you see with offensive linemen it's kind of they always have to shed that like if you're a first round pick you just get more benefit of the doubt because you know let's be real there's not like offensive line stats that you have so like your reputation matters a lot more than it does at other positions but i mean we're talking about a guy who's five time all pro six time pro bowl he has a chance here to win his second Super Bowl ring. This is like first ballot Hall of Famer type stuff. Like this is special. And here's the thing, RJ. Like he might retire in theory after this season because he's playing his age 35 year right now. The Eagles have Cam Jurgens, who he was very much on board right, you know, right. drafting. But like he's not really showing signs of slowing down. <laughs> like he feels like he could play for at least like one more season, if not a couple, and play at this kind of in crazy high level. Like this is yeah, he's he's incredible. So uh good talk- job by you. We talk a lot about luck, right? Like what relative to games and seasons, right? Like and and like earning your own luck, like with regards to the one seed and stuff like that. And like this isn't a fault by any means, but Jason Kelsey is really lucky, I think, to have like had the like career dominance he had specifically in this Eagles run, right? Like like if it had happened, even like if if you want to call it this like 
I don't know, six, seven year run, if that had happened from day one in his career, you know what I'm saying? Like it wouldn't have lined up as, as, as greatly as it has, it wouldn't have worked out with the talent around him and everything kind of coming together. And so like, sometimes that happens to players, right? Like, and sometimes players are on the, the wrong end of that, right? Like, you know, how many Pete loves to compare Mahomes to Michael Jordan, even though Sirianni does it with Jalen Hurts. Um, mm-hmm. Like how many players were unlucky to have like career dominance in the same era, right? You know what I'm saying? Like, it's just, it's fortunate for him that he's been as great as he has been in this moment in time for this particular, like, he is a legend as far as like, it, and there are different teams and places in sports, or whatever, where like, if you're a legend, if you're a great player, you live forever. And like Jason Kelsey, I think is one of those dudes with regards to the Eagles. Yeah. And Brandon Graham too. You know, it's a little sure, bit different yeah. in terms of BG doesn't have the all pros, but I mean, he's just, He's almost more of Mr. Eagle to me, just from a standpoint of it. He doesn't have to be, he's a very good player, but it doesn't have to be just star player. It's not always that obvious. Sometimes it can be just a player who's been around for so long and is such a good dude off the field. I mean, him and Kelsey are kind of hand in hand in that regard. And Nick Sirianni always credits having both of those guys as why he felt like he was able to have success or at least have confidence coming into this coaching opportunity because it wasn't like he was just taking over this totally young roster with no leadership. Like, he really leaned on Brandon Graham and Jason Kelsey. So I think those are kind of pillars of this Eagles era, specifically under Sirianni, in addition to what they've done in the past. And they're huge, uh, hugely important to the team. Are you ready to make your Super Bowl pick? Um, I want to say one last thing before I do, because um, mm-hmm. I tweeted about this. And you You're putting agree it off. with me. No, no, no. no. You agree with me. Um the Eagles are playing in their second Super Bowl oh boy. in six years. How is this complicated to people? I don't understand this. I know I you agree so with me. You agreed with me on the show comments. last week. I, okay. I, year doesn't mean anything to me in football because it's not a real thing. They play in multiple it is a real, years. Like, if, if you call it seasons or years or Super Bowls, any, they're seasons. You go by that's any, what they call them. It, we call no, them no, seasons. No, no, even if you go by that's years, what we call it them. Still, literally what we call them. But it is still six. Like, if you call it years, if you call it seasons, if you call it Super Bowls, it is a set of six, no matter what you're talking about. That's my point. If the Eagles won the Super Bowl, like they did, let's say, on February 4th, 2018, and then let's right. say they won the next Super Bowl the next year. So they won you two would not Super say Bowls they won in one two year? Super Bowls in a year. Like, you would not say that. Like, no. Like, no one would say that. Nope. I mean, no, they might. Like, no, but it wouldn't even be true. Like that's what I'm saying. Like n- nobody would say that because it wouldn't be true or correct. Would would you would you say, Brandon, that the Cowboys in the '90s won three Super Bowls in three years? Because the first one was the '92 season. Know the time right. frame of that. They won three out of four. Would would you ever refer to that as three Super Bowls in three years? No, they I won in 1992, 1993, and 1995. All I mean, right, I'm, like, I'm just, I can't do this. I'm People just get like, so I, mad about this my, in the comments take, that it like made me upset. <laughs> My problem with this is the people who are like, oh, no, it happened on February 4th, 2018. You're not counting that like like <laughs> like like you're, you're not you're, you're just taking that one day like you're, you're not actually counting that year, that season, right. that Super Bowl. Make like, your prediction. Make your prediction. I am picking the Chiefs to win. I'm I'm, I'm not going to like 10 points. I really no, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not that bullish. Um, 3130. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I, I want, think that's what it's going to be. I really be, want that. Like, like I, I want something awesome. Like, I want something fun. Um, I do kind of feel like the playoffs as a whole have been kind of lackluster. Um, like, like what yeah. was the best game this playoff season? Like, maybe the AFC title game? But speaking personally, Cowboys, the Cowboys ruined maybe. Well, the Cowboys, or the Cowboys ruined the AFC title game for me because right after the Eagles won the NFC title, that was when they moved on from Kellen Moore. So I spent half of the AFC title game doing crap with that. So I, I really want to just like see an epic game. That's what I want, but I'll I'll take the Chiefs to win, like I said, 31 30. Now you're gonna make your pick a lot, obviously, in a lot of different places. You're picking the Eagles to win. So if, if you want to change your score, by all means. So give us I'm a score. I'm not ready to say a score, but okay. um, then don't don't give us a score, but give us something that you believe will happen. Not that's a part of our same game parlay, because Brandon mm-hmm. and I uh, we'll do that with Steven Serta on Friday on the look ahead on the SB Nation NFL show. But something, it can be silly, it can be mundane, it can be big, it can be important, it can be epic, iconic, whatever you want. Something that will happen besides the Eagles winning. It just feels very hard to believe that we've seen, like, it feels like A.J. Brown's deal. Because he had these quieter games mm, against these 3 point. for 22 against the Giants. I forget what he had against the 49ers, but it wasn't much. He's going to get in the end zone. or if And if not, he's going to have a big day. Like, this Chiefs defense is Jerry Sneed is a, is a good player. He's a nice player. 
at the end of the day, though, I just feel like, you know, AJ Brown's also really, really good. And he's too good for him to have this quiet of a playoff. So I think he's going to go off in this game. I think he's going to have a big game. Um, almost maybe he's being slept on a little bit just because he's been quiet recently. It's like, oh, yeah, he's really good. We forgot about that. So I think he's going to have a big game. I don't want the Eagles in the Super Bowl, as mentioned, but like it would make sense if they want it for AJ to have had a big season. Like that was the big, yep. like if, if there was a poster for like the moves, so to mm-hmm. speak, that how we made, it would be AJ Brown, right? Like no disrespect to James Bradbury or anything. You know what I mean? Like Jordan Davis, like all these other things were big and important. Hassan Reddick, but like the, the big, you know, sort of meaty thing that he did was trading for AJ Brown. And that paid off over and over and over and over again. So it would, it would just be symbolic or parallel or whatever for him to have a big game. And he hasn't been far off. Like he, the past two games, I've mentioned this before, um, and and it's a concern with Hertz going into the Super Bowl. We'll see how he's doing with his downfield passing because he hasn't been great since coming back from the injury. But he's been open on two deep shots, and Hertz just hasn't hit him. So he's been getting open. Like that's not the issue. It's not like he's been struggling. It's just it hasn't materialized yet. And I feel like it's due to happen. Um, so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm leaning Eagles. I think it's going to be a really close game. I think the Eagles are going to find a way to pull it out again because my core tenant belief just goes back to Hertz. Like refusing to lose the game he's just so locked in it just hurts what 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 is hurts doing to the game he's refusing to lose the game he's refusing to lose hmm. interesting it's the battle of the two quarterbacks who refuse to lose the um first Super Bowl like that i um i was right on something i said to pete on monday football monday this is the first playoff game that patrick mahomes is playing and wearing his white jersey um so along those white lines jersey, I have a- red pants Right. I have a question for you. Um, so I've actually seen um, Seamus writing and, and, and doing stories about this. Like, I guess it's like impossible to get a green Eagles jersey, like with the Super Bowl patch on it right now. I did um, not. See, I saw he wrote that story. With all due respect, Seamus, I did not uh, open that story because I'm working on things. I haven't had the chance to do it yet. Sure, sure, sure. Um, but I've seen that going around. Yes. So this is a different take of mine. And if you get it as a gift, it's a different set of rules. But if, if you have the option. If you're say you're an Eagles fan and you're getting a jersey with the Super Bowl patch, the white one doesn't make any sense to me. Like again, if you have the option, I understand that there are li- like limited yeah. quantities and things like that. But like if you're getting the jersey with the Super Bowl Fifty Seven patch and you're an yeah, Eagles fan, you have to get the green one because that's the one they're wearing in the game. The white one makes no yeah. sense. Yeah, barring you know like you know maybe you don't have the money for it or whatever you know or it's a gift. Yeah, or, you uh, know, assuming whatever. all things are equal, that's what I'm but, saying. Like equal opportunity, equal cost, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, you ever notice the Chiefs have a lot of patches? Like Patrick Mahomes has a, a lot, lot of patches. patches. They, patches they have Mahomes. The, I don't know why they have the AFC patch. Have you ever like what is the deal? Like I don't know. Why do why do we need this? So we've got AFC. We've got uh captain's patch. Now we've got. The How do you Super feel Bowl about patch. the turtlenecks that they always rock in the pictures? You know, like the the pictures of the players, the the profiles, like the headshots. They always have the. You've never noticed that. They're like the only team that does um, that. They, have, they always have the white turtleneck in the oh, pictures yeah. where everyone else well, is just, you know, normal to, to, not. To your point, it's not like um, like a modern, you know, like Under Armour, Nike, no. you know, thing. It's it's like a cotton. It's like a Christmas <laughs> sweater. Yeah, like it's like a, like, uh, is it a mock, right? That's that's what it's called. Like, it's, it's like know. a, vin- it's a vintage looking thing. Um, I kind of like that. Like, I like some of the. There's not a lot of teams that have super traditionally things like that. Yeah. Um, like I like how I, guess. I like how the Packers have like a seamstress that, you know, does things. Like it's not like, you know, like stuff like that's cool to me. Um, and I like how how traditional the Chiefs are. Um, I will say this. I I really try my best not to troll. If the Chiefs win, I will absolutely tweet that Dallas beat the Eagles in the Super Bowl because they used to be the Dallas Texans. So that will be the one okay. trolley thing that's, I do. Uh, it's really <laughs> I mean, that's very <laughs> pathetic, but okay. I mean uh, I want to talk anything. about the rest of the division, RJ, quickly, because uh, you know, not as important as the Super Bowl. It is there is a lot of I will say, I will rub it in the faces of the non Eagle Sands here and be like, all these other things going on that aren't the season still. It's just very unser I'm like, who cares? <laughs> this is like stupid. Like, oh, um, offensive coordinator shirt. It's like who cares? Well, let's let's rip through this. Um, so we talked Kellen Moore is gone, obviously last week. Um we talked about Dan Quinn staying. Brian Schottenheimer is the new offensive coordinator for the Cowboys. Um, it was a promotion. But this is the general take. Like, uh, there's not a, a rational Cowboys fan who has any other sort of take. 
uh, it does it, it I don't want to like disrespect Brian Schottenheimer but it, it doesn't really matter like th- this is this is it was always going to be somebody who was close and like McCarthy that's who it is um, in this case obviously they worked together in Green Bay in case you did not know Brian's father Marty Schottenheimer gave McCarthy his first ever NFL job with the Chiefs incidentally um, and so it was always going to be a, a pro McCarthy guy because he's going to call the place and I I said last it week didn't have I, to be um, I mean it, but I it said was never... on the record. I said on the record before this even the hire was made. I said I think the Cowboys should get creative here because it's there. I know they're going to get you know go with familiarity, someone in the building or or someone that knows Mike McCarthy. And this is a nice opportunity, especially because why why fire Kellen Moore then? Like Schottenheimer is so much and and the upgrade from going from Kellen Moore to the combination of McCarthy calling the plays slash Schottenheimer attached. That's so much better than Kellen Moore. Like that's making worlds difference. I don't get that. I mean, again, like, I'm, like I'm, I'm not gonna like, make a change. Make you, a change. Well, I'm, I'm answering the question, like, why it was done. It was because they had to make a move. Like, they had to do something. Some, some, there had to be a fall guy for, for everything. Like, so that, like, it had to be Kellen Moore. Like, of all the available options, it had, it had to be. I mean, like, I, I, like you can laugh and snicker, but like, that's the truth. And again, it was always gonna be a Brian or like a Brian Schottenheimer archetype. Like, like somebody that was just a pro McCarthy guy. Like. We can sit here and say like, well, this would have been better. Like they're they're all in on McCarthy, and like I don't mean all in. Like we like, and I'm not saying they don't believe in him, but it's not like, oh, baby, like we know this is the path. We're all in. It's like, look, like we have enough invested here. Like whatever. Like it makes sense for us to line our chips up in this direction and hope mm. it pays off. I mean, they're pot committed at this point, so they're just doubling down. I feel like Cowboys fans should have feel should feel like the team could have done better. They could have been a little bit more creative. They didn't have to just bring in someone that McCarthy knew. They could have gotten someone here who could bring some fresh new ideas to the table. That seems like a unique opportunity to do so if you're getting rid of Kellen Moore as opposed to just someone who's going to be in lockstep with the play calling head coach at this point, especially considering shot in the Heimer's resume, right? Like this isn't a dude only off- who ahead. has had such great success. And like, oh, this is so inspiring. You look at his track record. I'm sure you've seen the Roger Sherman tweet, uh, formerly of SB Nation, Roger Sherman, at Roger on Twitter, who has like the the breakdown of like 28th ranked offense when he was the Washington quarterback coach. And then when he was in San Diego, the only year of Drew Brees' career where he didn't look like a Hall of Famer, and then so on and so forth. Um, Just a, a big resume of not being impressive, including the Cowboys playoff win over the Seahawks where the Seahawks stubbornly refused to throw the ball at all for some reason and had to get the ball to Mike Davis and Chris Carson a bunch of times, even though it wasn't working clearly and had success whenever they did actually throw the ball. Like it just feels like they could have done better. That's how I feel about it. Like I'm looking at this move. I'm like, great. I'm, I'm not like, I'm not going to sit here and tell you like, like how are you not respecting the hire? But like, it it makes sense with what they're lined up Mm. to do. Like, and so um, and they needed somebody who had a heavier emphasis on running the ball and like to install oh, this, the offense. And that absolutely sense. means Zeke and Pollard are both coming back, by the way. See, like you're look, you're just doing the like silly low hanging no, thing. I when there's that. Like, I believe that no, wholeheartedly. I, that, I that, well, that would be wrong. Like, <laughs> because okay. like, again, they, they want somebody to install the offense and to like develop the run game during the week. And Mike Mc, Mike McCarthy is going to focus on the passing game, like that's his thing. Like, and so obviously he trusts Brian Schottenheimer to install the offense and set things up. And so um, it it makes sense. I don't. I'm not going to sit here and like bet on that, but it it does make sense based on the variables and circumstances that they have in this particular moment. I have no idea what they're going to do in the running game, but like, I Zeke there are back. enough. He's absolutely there, back. You know it. There are there are enough people that are super closely related to the organization that are floating out the idea that he's gone. And I, mm. I, I've, I've said this before, like, I don't want to like sit here and root for, I don't want to root for anybody to be cut or fired or whatever. Like it's not a comfortable thing, but I will be impressed with McCarthy. If Zeke is gone, like, that, that will mean he won. Um, I'm legitimately be a pay cut. That's I'm, why I'm legitimately unsure on Tony Pollard. I don't know. The injury is such a, a factor now. It's so hard to, um figure out what the best thing is the michael gallup situation a year ago is is really fresh he had knee surgery a week ago uh on the other knee not the one he tore um his acl from a year ago so i mean it's it's a really scary proposition to just pay him and assume everything's going to work out i i don't think everything's on the table like equally on the table i don't think there's any like likelihood or anything i i think that i if i had to predict just a pure prediction i would Mm -hmm. predict that zeke is gone and 
honestly, they let Pollard walk and pick up a comp mm. pick. But, um, but, and I don't think like the Bijan Robinson stuff is such a low hanging fruit. Like we don't have to do this thing. But I mean, it it will be some combination of lower level free agent Malik Davis and maybe a day three pick. I think the smart play would be to cut Zeke, not bring him back at a discounted rate. That is dumb. I I just I feel I, like I can I'm envision. I, I'm not saying you're saying that, but I feel like on it, I just can only envision. Zeke taking a pay cut and some Cowboys supporters being like, oh, this is a great move. We get Zeke back and he has a lower rate. No, you need to cut clean, make a clean cut, break free, be done with that. And with Pollard, there's there should be a world where he's brought back, but it's you let him test the market. And then you see what's out there. And there's there's a chance because of his injury and the uncertainty that you could bring him back maybe on a one-year deal that's less than you expect something that works out for both sides. But basically the point is there, like you have to slow play that one. You can't, don't try to, you know, tag them or beat the, beat the, the market to the punch. Don't do that. Just let him sit out there. And if you lose him, you have to live with that, but don't close the door on signing him. If the number makes I, sense. I just want to say this for you and for other Eagles fans there, like there are fans of every like creed and belief, right? Like, so there are definitely Cowboys fans are like, no, you got to bring Steve back the majority of people share your sentiment. Like, just so we're clear, like, I, you don't have to tell me, like, I've seen Cowboys fans saying this. Like, of course, you can find me a Cowboys fan that says, like, Romo should still be the starting quarterback. Uh, by the way, interesting how the heat has come for him now as of late. Um, but, I was uh, never on board. Um, of, of course let's go to okay. the Giants, where they might lose Mike Kafka, who is still in the running, I believe, named a finalist for that Arizona Cardinals job. So that'd be kind of, like, disruptive, you know? I mean, that would kind of be, like, a bummer. Not to say they're screwed because they lose him, but to lose him after one season and like Daniel Jones finally kind of turning this corner and things looking like promising for a little bit and to lose him after one season, I feel like that would kind of be a big bummer. I don't know that it, I think it would be a big bummer. I mean, they have Brian. It Daniel. would. Like they have, ruining your no, continuity. I, I mean, again, like I'm not saying the like bum scale is like 0%, but like it, your bummer scale, like, but it, it would, it would not not be like like if, if i had to like assign it a value on the like spectrum like zero to 100 percent, i think it's it's lower than 50 i mean it, it could be like relative to context like relative to the fact that they have brian david like they've been in the wilderness for so long you know what i'm saying so like they've been in the wilderness they're out of the wilderness they're eating a warm meal they have a blanket draped around their shoulders and you're walking up to them and you're like oh dude like somebody took the shoelaces off of your shoe you're like oh mm. that sucks but like you know i think it's like, like all things shoes off, not I'm just good. the shoelaces Okay, cool. You yeah, you got to walk back up to the castle. Um, I don't know if you're Barefoot. gonna get the Harry Potter game. I'm pumped. I'm pumped about it. That's what I was thinking about when I brought up the force. Uh, but yeah, maybe not barefoot. Like you got socks on. You know what I mean? Like you're not completely barefoot, so it could be much worse. So that's what's going on with the Giants, really. Uh, the big okay. the big things are like, are they going to resign Saquon? What are they going to do with Daniel? Right, jo- right, I mean, Daniel right. Jones is going to be back. It's just a matter of what's the deal look like, and then we'll see what they do with Saquon. Uh, Washington. Not, not a lot going on. Still looking for an offensive coordinator, right? But there hasn't even been a lot of buzz on that. And that's it. That's it, man. There's nothing going on there. Um, generally chill times in the division. It's just it's the Eagle show right now. That's, that's who's really their quarterback going to be? Because I, I have seen that at Hogshaven. They, the Hogshaven, at least from what I can tell, very set on no more retreads. Like no I don't, more retreads. Yeah, I don't think they're getting Derek Carr. Like I don't think they're in the mix for one of these like kind of top level moves. Um, I think it's somebody There's literally who, like, an article that says no more retreads at quarterback for Washington with 282 comments. And there's a poll here, RJ, which I will get to, um, but say what you want to say. I mean, I think it's some sort of free agent signing, like depend like contingent upon who is ultimately available, but like somebody off the open market, if that winds up being Jimmy Garoppolo or Jameis Winston or Mitchell Trubisky, like, I think it's something like that. Like it's some sort of open market signing um, paired with a draft pick um that with an eye towards the future might not be the worst idea for them i don't know who they can realistically hire or draw away i was going to say ideally I, this is what i would do if i were them probably not going to be able to get away with it but if i were them i tried to hire eagles passing game coordinator kevin patullo who is like nick sirianni's boy because you're getting that Colts connection and then i would try to to maybe sign jacoby Brissett to compete with yeah. uh, sam howell to push him because Brissett is known for being a very good like culture locker room guy and you need that, I think, in that situation. He's not going to carry them by any means, but you kind of just have a stability there that if the floor falls out with Sam Howell and he ends up, he totally distincts and isn't any good at all, then at least you have something to fall back on. Not that, it, again, you're not making a ton of long-term progress with that. I will say this poll at uh, Hogshaven, RJ, 
72% of the voters with about 3,000 votes cast want to roll with Sam Howell through thick and thin. The second most popular option is sign a I, modest veteran and let Howell and the veteran battle, battle I it think out. that's that's fine. Like, I mean, this might be the last year of the Rivera era, the Rivera. Um, so like the last thing you want to do is like, you know, you know, stick your new head coach with, yeah, yeah, like, you know, in year two of like a quarterback, he may not love. Um, so I agree. I just saw right now, as you were talking, a report from SNY, uh, from Connor Hughes, that Daniel Jones's price tag is believed to be between 35 and $37 million a year. Hmm. It's a lot of money. It's not I think um, it's really not relative to the quarterback market, but no, yeah. that's that's why like people that are like Dak's making 40 million a year. If Daniel Jones is making 35 or 37 million dollars a year and Dak's making 40 million a year, like sign me up for this reality. Like that's an incredible bargain. Like it's there's, just, there's really no bargains at quarterback for the most part. I mean, it's In a bargain of, like, relative. It's It becomes a bargain like as soon as the next deal is signed. That's the way I mean. Works. Yes, relatively, but in terms of like a bigger scale, no. It's either like quarterbacks are usually paid nothing at all, <laughs> relatively, like the rookies, or a ton. And it's various amounts of a ton. And there's a unique time where someone does become a bargain, like Jared Goff. Jared Goff right now is a bargain because mm-hmm. you're, you're producing like very high level offensive numbers with a guy who I forget where he ranks exactly. But because of the Lions trading for him, too, and not owing him that guaranteed money, and because of how long ago he signed that deal, like that's a legitimate bargain for the production Gina you're Smith, getting out of that another kind of player. Example. But, but here's the thing with those guys. That doesn't last. Like I'm, right. I guarantee you Jared Goff is going to get some kind of like extra incentive or more guarantees thrown onto his deal because there's like, there's like a respect thing with that. And these agents of these quarterbacks aren't going to just allow the teams to get away with like having a super crazy bargain. There's going to be something done to rectify that. It won't be he becomes the highest paid quarterback, but you're not going to get away with like an absolute steal like that. You're just not. So, Agreed. Um, yeah, they're going to have outside, to pay Jim outside of the outside of the player being on their rookie contract, which, by the way, yeah. we'll obviously talk about Jalen Hurts and everything. Uh, we've got big time players in the NFC East eligible for new deals this offseason. Jalen Hurts leads the way. Uh, C.D. Lamb, Trayvon Diggs. Um, I guess a lot of different Eagles uh, free agents who are going to be up for. Well, I meant like grabs. rookies, but yeah, like new new deals, obviously as well. Um, so yeah, or not rookies, rookie contracts. Um, but Jalen Hurts and CD Lamb and Trayvon probably the biggest, like again, because they're coming off their rookie ones and stuff. So, um, okay. Uh, the very last thing I wanted to say, um, I have slowly over the last few years been watching Seinfeld all the way through. I think I've told you this at a certain point. Same. Yeah. Um, so I'm wearing the shirt. Um, I have one episode left the finale and i'm going to watch it tonight and we're recording this on tuesday so when this episode is out i will have finally seen all of seinfeld Jamie, congratulations uh you have time to do things like that i don't because i'm actually covering a team in the super bowl i made all these jokes i gave all the props i don't know why this is necessary like i tried to be very kind and very i mean it's not even a joke like that's true i i wish i could watch seinfeld this week i'll get i'll get to it next week after the eagles win seinfeld new harry potter game i'm living large parade uh yeah um let's get out of here brandon tell us your favorite thing about the eagles and then we leave these pretzels are making me thirsty <laughs>